Hello, everyone, and welcome to LSE Ideas and today's Meet the Leader session with Michelle Walker. Uh, please note that this event is being recorded and we expect to publish it online. Uh, we'd also like this to be as interactive as possible, so please ask questions on Zoom using the Q&A function. Uh, we have just under one hour in total. My name is Lutfi Siddiqui and joining me today on the host's side of the table are my colleagues from LSE Ideas. There's Marta Kozielska, uh, Hugo Jones and Lucas Fiala. Our distinguished guest, uh, as you know, is Michelle Walker. I had the pleasure of meeting Michelle several years ago when she was president of the World Policy Institute in New York. She's now the founder of Grey Rhino and Company, joining us from Chicago. Uh, she's probably best known for her book, The Grey Rhino, How to Recognize and Act on the Obvious Dangers We Ignore. The concept is now much quoted around the world, especially in Asia, particularly in the context of China, by policymakers, business leaders alike. I'm told that there's even a K-pop song and a Japanese video game and an Australian dance move inspired by it. Previously, Michelle covered emerging markets for news organizations, latterly as Latin America Bureau Chief for IFR, the International Financing Review. And perhaps we'll talk a little bit about emerging markets today as well. So uh, without further ado, Michelle, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here virtually in, in London and Singapore. That's right. Okay, so let me dive into my, my first question, which is about the origin story of uh, the Grey Rhino. I remember uh, it was Davos 2013 when you made your uh, presentation, when you first introduced the concept. What, was, what happened in the run-up to that? What made you uh, go with that big reveal? Well, it actually went all the way back to when I was the Latin America Bureau Chief at International Financing Review, as you've uh, noticed. And I was back and forth to London all the time when I was doing that. Um, I had been uh, covering the crisis in Argentina in, 2000, in the year 2000 as it unraveled. And about nine months before Argentina's currency collapsed and it defaulted on the debt, a lot of really smart people on Wall Street had a proposal for a preemptive restructuring, which would have been about a 30% write down. And it didn't happen for various reasons. And so of course, investors lost 70% of their money and were wrangling for illegally for 16 years. It was a big mess. So you fast forward to 2011, where you have Greece in a somewhat similar situation, only this time the Euro was at stake. People thought pretty much that if, if Greece went down, the Euro would too. And I looked at the dynamics, you know, debt going up, GDP going down, reserves going, you know, pretty, pretty simple. And I wrote a paper saying, basically, uh, Greece learned from Argentina, don't do what Argentina did. And it, at the very last minute, you know, midnight hour, uh, Greece and its creditors came to an agreement and they pulled back. It was still a big haircut, but it wasn't chaotic and the euro didn't come down as well. And I really got to thinking in spring of uh, 2012, how come one country saw the big scary thing coming and did something about it and the other one didn't? And I realized that not everybody geeks out on uh, sovereign credit spreads the way uh, I had. And I also realized that this was a much bigger question than just uh, you know, the capital markets. And I, I, I saw it for policy, for things like climate change, for you know, corporate strategy. And since the book came out, people have actually been using it for personal issues, which was a huge surprise to me. Um, but I wanted to, so I wanted to write about this in a way that wasn't geeky. And I, I basically went back to the tradition of Aesop using an animal to talk about human things. And uh, I was talking to a friend in my office, a, a, a very senior corporate M&A lawyer, and I was describing the book and what I was trying to do. I said, you know, it's really big. It's coming at you. It's, it's really dangerous. And that's when this sort of rhino with a horn popped into my head, you know, envisioning it coming at me. And, and I've learned through my, my time in policy and as, and as author that it's not just facts. You know, you, if you want people to change things, you can't just throw them a spreadsheet and an analysis and say, I'm really smart. This is what you should do. You need to create this emotional connection. And so that came up. And then he made a joke about the black swan, you know, the thing that's so improbable that you can't even imagine it. He said, oh, you could call it a black rhino. 
And I was like, well, I don't want to be derivative of that because it's badly misused. It wasn't intended to be used as a cop out, but it is. And, you know, all these people are saying I'm spotting the next black swan when the whole point is that you can't see it ahead of time. So I'm like, I really don't want to be derivative of, of that. But I went to the zoo when I was in the sixth grade, maybe. And I think I saw something that was called the black rhino, but wasn't there also a white rhino? Let me see. I went to Wikipedia because I couldn't really remember from the sixth grade. And that's when I realized the black rhinos are gray and the white rhinos are gray. And it should be kind of obvious that they're gray because you're looking at this big two-ton thing in front of you. That's gray. But we don't call it that. So that seemed to be a great metaphor for how vulnerable we are to getting trampled by obvious things, to just missing the obvious thing uh, in, in front of us. And so that's how the, the term came about. I see. And why isn't just the elephant in the room? So the elephant in the room just stands there. And, and the very definition of the elephant in the room is that nobody says or does anything. And it normalizes that. And a couple of people have tried to talk about the rhino in the room, and it drives me crazy because that's not what it's for. You know, it's it's basically a challenge to the black swan and to the elephant in the room. The the gray rhino is dynamic. It's you know it's coming at you. It's pawing the ground and snorting and getting ready to charge, and it gives you a choice of what to do. And people are talking about it. Some people are doing about it, doing something about it, and the idea was really to help people to challenge themselves. Am I the kind of person who stands up to the gray rhino, who lets it trample other people, who lets myself get trampled, or do I use its strength to move forward? So it's, you know, it's large and gray, yes, like the elephant in the room, but it's definitely not just uh, standing there. Absolutely. And, and over time, when I use the concept, and one of the questions I'm going to ask you is, you know, what other things drive you, drive you mad in terms of the abuse of the term? Uh, but when I use it, I also refer to the fact that to me, it's something that's visible, but when it charges, there is convexity in it. There's speed is, can, can accelerate so quickly that by that time, it's too late. Um, can I just go back to basics and ask you, in your own words, what is the great rhino? Uh, the gray rhino. How gray rhino is the big scary thing that's, that's in front of you that you shouldn't be able to ignore, but sometimes you do anyway. And that gives you a choice to do something about it. But you know, importantly, we're very vulnerable to missing what's in front of us, but we're not condemned to it. In fact, you ask about you know, things that drive me crazy is some people come out and say that a gray rhino is something that by definition is ignored. I'm like, no, that's the elephant in the room. My point is that all obvious things get ignored because they're obvious. And the gray rhino is a way to draw attention to that vulnerability and also challenge us to, to act. But is it rational not to act? Are we being a bit harsh by, you know, with the benefit of hindsight to say that, oh, you're, you're being more like Argentina than Greece? Um, is it just that, look, sometimes it's too costly to act? And so by hoping and praying that the rhino doesn't charge may be the rational thing to do, or am I not thinking about it the right way? Well, first of all, it's really meant to be looking ahead, not just in hindsight. We can use you know, hindsight for some examples, but I get asked all the time, was the Suez Canal ship that got stuck a gray rhino? Was the Texas deep freeze a gray rhino? Was this a gray? And I'm like, Look forward, look ahead. I always, I've basically stopped answering that question when journalists ask me because literally yesterday I got asked by a journalist in Spain and a journalist port in Portugal about the Ukraine situation and the, and the pandemic. But you know, it's a forward looking concept. And part of my point too is that, well, it depends on what you mean by rational. Um, part of my point is that there's no shame in recognizing how vulnerable we are to the big obvious things in the world, uh, because that's how our brains are wired. We've got all sorts of cognitive biases that get in the way of, of standing up to the obvious things. And there, there are different reasons, and those reasons are different depending on where the gray rhino is in front of you and how you are responding. I mean, some people are in denial because something's just too big and they can't handle it. 
some of them are in denial because they know that the solution is not something they're going to like, so they're just going to leave it. Sometimes they don't feel they have any power to do something about it and push the responsibility off onto someone else. Uh, so there are lots and lots of reasons for denial. Uh, there are lots and lots of reasons, even once you stop denying and saying, hey, it's yeah, I know it's there, but I have 542 reasons why I'm not going to deal with it. And there are legitimate reasons that you don't have the resources. You're so up to your neck in all the everyday things. You know, the people who have the power to do something about it don't do anything. And you know, so there are lots of reasons, and it's important to figure out what the reasons are at that stage. But then you need to flip forward to, okay, what does it take to get past those obstacles. And that's the leap that gray rhino theory really tries to get people to make. I see. I see. So we will uh, talk a bit more about um, use cases, you know, what contexts uh, is it useful in, and we'll certainly go to China and Asia. But before that, I just want to check if Alexandria Fisher is here online with us. Um, she I think has some interesting comments to make about uh, a use case in the world of ESG. And I wonder if we can give her the mic so that she can either ask you a question or, um, or jump in with a comment uh, at this point. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. So um, I have been in the ESG space since around 2015, but I've always kind of been in the public policy, um, public sector innovation labs. And so the idea of the gray rhino really resonated with me because when I got started working for an institutional investor in 2015, I was blown away by how ineffective the systems was, systems were internally and how big obvious things are being overlooked in decision making. Um, and so I don't know if you're familiar with the Canadian situation of valent in around where the stock price declined 90% in around, in a matter of a year. But the ESG team was screaming from the rooftops that this was coming. And the people within the company failed to materially recognize it in any way. And it just kind of, and the thing we kept being told was they didn't see it and if they, and if we were wrong, they would have hell to pay. Um, and so there are two things that really started bothering me, especially as climate started becoming more high profile, is people were not acting on best information to have risk in return, which I thought was inconsistent with their fiduciary duty, but also the amount of really smart people that were falling prey to their behavioral biases and the amount of emphasis being put on ESG, the ESG profession to actually like for, like more accurately forecast the details and timing. And so learning about the gray rhino and the framework helped me have the tools to help me understand the tools better to create change in the organizations as well as frame it in different ways that actually got more traction Probably. but i think one of the things that i still struggle with to this day is even though we have even though we have the data is getting better and I think we're in a really good place overall and we're seeing this change. My question for Michelle is how do you still contend with the pressure on ESG analysts or other people to be perfect and be allowed to make mistakes? And a lot of the time we can say statistically this event, an ESG event is very likely to happen, but we can't tell when or when and how to kind of get around that when people want the definitive answer which you're unable to provide and because you can't provide that answer 100% your work is dismissed. Thank you Alexandra. That, that is actually it's a great question and it's really about you know where some of my work has evolved it's really about uncertainty. Um, people have this weird obsession with predictions uh, people always ask me, you know, what's the next gray rhino? You know, what's the next thing? They, they like to make lists. You know, the beginning of the year, there are all of these top risk lists. And people make the list 
to say that they made the lists, but then they don't really look at their response or what's happening. And then I think this is true more in the US than I've seen certainly in Asia or, or even in Europe. But people are like, if you can't tell me exactly what day and what minute and by how many points the stock market is going to drop, then that's not a pre pred prediction. And of course, parameters are very important with predictions. And a lot of gray rhinos are cases where you know something's likely to happen, but you really don't know the specific. And to, to be honest, you don't need the specifics to know that you need to start doing something about climate change. Um, you don't need to know the specifics of, of a you know supply chain disruption, which we're you know constantly going through these days. Um, you know, I think it's it really goes back to the principle of of looking at different scenarios, including a worst case scenario that's even worse than what you would think, and a best case scenario that's better than what you would think. And prioritizing things, I mean, you have to do some estimation of, of how soon something's going to happen or how big it's going to be, but it doesn't have to be precise. And I think this is a case of, you know, perfect being the enemy of the good. And we focus so much on predictions, you know, you know, all of these firms put out their predictions as a way of saying how smart their analysts are. And then most of them just don't say anything about it when they don't get it right. Uh, Byron Ween, who I, I talk about in The Gray Rhino, has this great top surprises list where at the end of the year, he does go back and review what worked out and what didn't. And his point is not to get everyone right, but to think about all of the possibilities, to stretch his mind, to see where there are gaps in the market between, you know, between people who see certain gray rhinos and people who don't. And the other part about the gray rhino is that if you're doing it right, you make a forecast, you do what you need to keep it from happening, and it doesn't happen. Does that mean your forecast was wrong in the first place? No, it means you had a really good response. And as humans, we're really bad at recognizing those responses. And so one of the things that I'm really trying to do is to shift this attention from, you know, risks and, you know, imagining black swan risks that by definition you can't imagine, which seems to me a, a fool's errand to me, but to really turn, turn it back and say, okay, what are we doing to deal with this? How well prepared are we? And obviously you can't prepare for everything, but you can create a system where you've got people in place who are really good at pivoting if you need to. You can create redundancies and, and partnerships and, and networks, and you can do things that make it much easier. You can also practice your, your risk skills, build your risk muscle, get better at dealing with uncertainty. If you have small uncertainties day to day, it makes it much easier to take big risks, to deal with bigger uncertainties. But it really does come down to not focusing so much on perfection or the absolute right prediction, but really taking a hard, honest look at responses. Oh, that is super interesting. That helped clarify some things. Uh, two of the things I'm starting to look more at now are around ESG and near misses in companies and how that can be used as indicators, as well as the response, as well as breaking it down into ESG kind of event risks versus erosion risks, uh, because the response to those things are incredibly different from investors. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. Thanks, Michelle, for taking that question. Um, moving on, I'd like to ask Hugo to, um, uh, to ask the next question. Michelle, I'm going to come back to you a little bit later with this thing you touched on very briefly, which is whether the US is different from the rest of the world in its response or adoption of the concept and why that might be the case. But before that, Hugo, over to you, please. Thanks so much. Hi, Michelle. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I really enjoyed reading your most recent book, uh, You Are What You Risk. Um, parts of it resonated on quite a personal level, uh, such as the, the, the risk fingerprint, the idea that everyone has their own very unique uh, conception of, of risk, uh, which I think was the intention compared to your last book, The Grey Rhino, uh, which was intended for sort of policy and, and business circles. So uh, I've got two questions, both relating to China. Um, Firstly, from your perspective, how did it come to be that the term grey rhino became just became permeated uh, Chinese society? I've got friends in Beijing uh, who have 
uh, very little uh, grasp on, on domestic or international politics or even uh, business and economy, but they know uh, they know uh, Hui, uh, the, the, the grey rhino uh, very well. Yeah. We um, knew. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how did that come to be? What was the process that led, led to it uh, being so influential in China? And then secondly, um, when you talk in You Are What You Risk about certain concepts such as the risk fingerprint, risk agency, risk muscle, risk portfolio, which are quite sort of individualized risk. Um, I wonder how, how well have the, this sort of vocabulary uh, traversed Chinese society and politics, given that in China at the moment, the trend seems to be towards uh, collective risk, uh, at least the, the party would like to, to promote the idea uh, with initiatives such as Common Prosperity. Thanks, those are great questions. Well, you know, I have to say, I asked myself the same question about, about China for a while. And, you know, it was funny, it was a surprise to me that the book came out there because the, the uh, I, I, I knew that it'd come out in Taiwan, there had been a, a bidding war, that it was going to come out in Taiwan. But the, you know, the, the email went astray when the publisher sold the rights to China. So I got this question, you know, about the, for the Chinese translation, which I assume was, was for Taiwan, about whether the sister I referred to was a big sister or a younger or a younger sister, because it's different words in Chinese. And so I just, I was like, oh yeah, there's a Taiwan edition. And then a couple of weeks later, I get this request saying, oh, can you send a video because your publisher owns bookstores in 80 airports in China and they want to do, the, they want to put the video in the bookstores. And I was like, okay, so this is not the, China, the Taiwan edition because, you know, one is traditional and the other is, is, is simplified characters. So it's just totally different editions. And so I emailed my publisher. I'm like, did you forget to tell me something? He said, oh yeah, yeah, we, it's coming out in China in, in three weeks. So, so I you know, got the video and uh, I, it, the book had been out for about three weeks when I, I emailed my editor, just wanting to be sure that they got the video. And she emails back, she says, oh yes, it's great. And you'll be happy to know that the book's already got into its third printing, 30,000 copies. And I was like, is, is that with four zeros? <laughs> she says, yes, it's with four zeros. I now have gotten much better at, 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 at I, I'm still surprised, but not as surprised by the scale of things in China. And, uh, you know, so I was in China a couple of times that year and, and interviewed by all of the media. And actually, look, in hindsight, some of the questions they asked me have been very big. It was about, uh, you know, a, a conflict between a hardware company and an internet platform about who owned the data, which, of course, has been very much uh, in the news over the last year. Um, and But I asked people, I said, well, what is this? And they said, you gave us a way to talk about something that was on our minds. And that was the best explanation that I could get. And I also found uh, that the interest in what I talk about in China is very different from in the U.S. You know, I talk about financial fragilities and inequality, and, you know, asset bubbles and, and corporate debt and, and things like that in China and climate change as well. And those are the things that I get asked to talk about there. I talk a lot about ESG in China. I've given a couple of, of virtual addresses recently. And, you know, in the U.S., they're like, oh, asset bubble, what asset bubble? Let's pump some more air into it. And just completely different conversations. And that blew my mind. So that's actually what led me to write You Are What You Risk. As you know, there's a whole chapter on different countries having very different uh, approaches to risk. Um, and I, I ended up taking the personal focus on this book, uh, which was something very different for me because... I came to understand that there is this, this feedback loop between personal risk perceptions and behaviors, organizational and societal, and you can't separate them. And actually writing about those three together was a huge risk in publishing. Uh, first of all, because this sort of systems thinking is much more common in Asia. That US publishers, they're like very linear things. And in fact, I write about a, a book that came out uh, in Germany, a design book by, uh, by a Chinese author about the difference between East and West. And they've got these red and blue diagrams that show, you know, very linear connections between the dots in the West, but, you know, a complex network in Asia. So I think my brain somehow ended up being more Asian than, than Western. Uh, so that's, that's part of it. 
Um, but we've also seen in the West many more decisions by boards when CEOs are making really bad personal risk decisions, like you know, sleeping with spies and bragging about it. And you know, their, their insurer came and said, you know, we're not going to insure your company anymore as long as this guy's there. Uh, you know, people coming out and throwing tantrums if they don't get the right kind of tequila, and you know, being bad to their employees. You know, those sort of you know personal behaviors are finally getting attention in the West. But it's been very interesting. So the new book, You Are What You Risk, came out in China at the end of August, early September. And I've done a lot of conversations in the Chinese media, uh, have gotten a lot of really, really interesting questions about that, particularly about young people uh, in China and how the risk environment is changing for them. But I think a lot of the concepts are very, very relevant to this whole conversation about, about real estate. And you know about Evergrande, which which companies the government is going to let go under or not, and how much control it's going to have over the, those companies. The government is trying to signal that no, you can't count on us to just keep everything going. You are assuming some risk as well. That right now, you know, the speculators are getting much more of the benefit, and uh, you know, people who want to individual homeowners who want to buy homes are getting priced out. You know, there's really risks on both sides of that. So they've been completely trying to change the way people think about risk. Going back to 2017, uh, there was a front page editorial in People's Daily about the need to watch out for gray rhino risks. And a small cap and tech stocks, which were perceived as the riskiest, fell by around 5% in a single day because investors rightly interpreted that as, you know, the government going after uh, financial risk, in, in particular, you know, real estate, corporate debt, uh, online products that hadn't been properly regulated yet, uh, wealth management, people coming out saying, hey, hey, less risk, you know, more profit, you know, when it didn't add up. So you saw the next spring, they let a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer lenders go under. And that was a deliberate policy decision. Uh, fall of 2017, you started seeing changes in, uh, in mortgage standards. And you saw throughout 2018, uh, this attempt to slowly let the air out of the real estate bubble, which was fascinating. And in fact, in August of 2017, right after this editorial, Evergrande made its first announcement that it was going to start reducing its, uh, its debt. So 2018, you see all this Western media going, oh, particularly US media going, oh, we're really winning this trade war. Look at how the real estate market is going down. And I say, you guys don't understand what's going on at all. This is a very deliberate decision to address the risk of asset bubbles and the risk of, of housing affordability. And, you know, and that was all deliberate. And so you saw a lot of it last fall. Gray Rhino was in the news a lot again last fall with Evergrande and the crackdowns on some of the, the other real estate uh, developers. And it's really become a communications tool in this conversation about how do we better communicate what risks are okay and not how do we encourage uh, constructive risk taking, but not let the speculators get all the, the profits from, uh, from our policies. So the new book came out very, very interesting time, uh, you know, aligning with what the Chinese government has been trying to do to change people's risk perceptions. Wow. That's uh, I I didn't know any of this. It's fantastic. Thanks for that, uh, Michelle. Um, Marta, over to you. Thanks very much, Lutzi. And hi, Michelle. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so yeah, I have two questions. And before we get back uh, to Lutfi, who's going to take a very country-specific sp country perspective as well, I wanted to take a step back and build on what you said already a little bit. So as you said, for different reasons, policymakers, business leaders, investors choose to either avoid engaging with risks or choose not to see them, whether it's subconscious or conscious. So I wanted to ask more generally, how do we change our mindset to first acknowledge them and see them and identify them and then strategically tackle them and also have our stakeholders on board to be able to tackle them? Um, and second question is, you know, despite the country's specific understanding of risk and uncertainty, I wanted to look at the concept of black swan and grey rhino a bit more globally. But I also don't know whether that's a productive way to use that concept, because the more broadly defined issue, probably the, the, the less can we do about it. 
right? Um, so the, the, the less specific. Um, but and I was going to actually start listing, you know, the pandemic and soaring inflation and the war. But I know you don't answer these questions anymore. So without listing these issues, I'll answer them forward <laughs> That's not in hindsight, right? If well, it's not in front of us, I'm totally good with it. Okay. <laughs> So that's right. So, um, you know, and then there are still issues that are still kind of mounting as a result of these issues, which could be kind of some, somewhat differentiated, like the inequalities as a result of the pandemic or the inflation and the climate crisis, which is kind of, you know, still very much so ahead of us and behind us. But, um, you, you know, and again, a bit more general, but what is the biggest black swan and grey rhino that you might see kind of coming um, current, currently? Um, whether it's country specific or, or a bit more global, um, depends what perspective you'd like to take on that. All right, well, first of all, I don't see any black swans coming because you don't see them come. It, that's the whole point. That's right. Um, you yeah. know, the point, actually, I was, I was on a panel in Dubai last fall um, with the author of the black swan uh, and with the creator of the Dragon King concept, which is something, it's, it's a, a very big thing that's uh, different from all the other big things like it, like, you know, wildfires or financial crises, or, you know, it's, it's something that happens a lot, but it's a particularly extreme situation. Um, and, you know, it was very interesting in that panel. Uh, interestingly, it was actually hosted by a Russian company. So I'm glad it happened last fall instead of being scheduled for this spring. But, you know, he, he made a point that I hadn't really grasped as much before, but it's that, uh, you know, his work is really about helping people to, uh, be more comfortable with the fact that there's a heck of a lot of uncertainty and that when you accept that you don't know everything that's going to happen, that you're going to get surprises, uh, it becomes easier. You don't feel so sideswiped when it does happen. Um, so as far as, you know, gray rhinos ahead of us, uh, I generally am focused on a triad of gray rhinos. And interestingly, a group of gray rhinos zoologically is called a crash which is just so perfect given my background in financial markets. Um, but there are three that are interrelated. So you have these financial fragilities, which is a you know, very loose monetary policy for a very long time, which has led to a lot of asset bubbles, uh, to a lot of concentration of wealth, to, uh, to over-borrowing. You know, for some companies, actually locking in a really low rate for a really long time is good. But for other companies, you know, basically borrowing at zero in order to buy back your stocks to pump up already overheated markets uh, is really dangerous, partly because it sucks money out of the real economy into the financialized economy. And at some point, the financialized economy is going to collapse once there's no, you know, the real economy is, is struggling because people are putting money into you know, paper profits instead of into bricks and mortar and companies and, and, and jobs and creating things. Um, that ties directly to inequality. You know, the people at the bottom of the economy, if they don't have money to spend on things, the economy at some point is going to choke up. It's like, you know, you don't have oil in your car. The engine's going to seize up. And then the third one is, is climate change, which is tied to inequality in that, as we know, the people who've contributed the least to the problem are the ones who are most vulnerable. But then that ties back to financial fragilities. You've seen all of the statements from from investors, from international groups, from regulators, from central banks over the last couple of years uh, about the very close connections between climate risk and financial risk. Um, you think about, you know, go back to the great financial crisis a decade or so ago, it was an insurance company going down that really tipped things over. And where's the big climate risk? You know, insurance. That's, you know, I've, I do a lot of talking to insurance companies and, and they're very concerned that they're not capitalized properly to deal with the extreme weather events. And you see every year, you know, the first six months of last year were the biggest, uh, the biggest amount of claims since 2010, which was the, uh, the, the uh, Japanese tsunami and nuclear incident. Um, so you're seeing increasing claims and this big gap. Um, so insurance companies are very worried about that and they could be the domino that knocks all the other dominoes over. So those three go to go together. Um, and then and then just briefly uh, you're on your question about how do you deal with these self-awareness. I mean just starting with that recognition that we're not as good as we think we are at dealing with obvious things. And it's been very interesting to see the reaction in the US. Uh, when I first uh, was shopping the book concept around all these editors came back and said, why do we need to book to talk about why we need to deal with obvious things? That's not counterintuitive. 
if they're obvious, we're dealing with them. And that point I was like, oh man, this is so counterintuitive. They don't even know it's counterintuitive. And so in talking about it, that's when I uh, amped up the talking about uh, gray rhinos being you know, ignored or neglected. And that's actually what's, you know, I, it, in hindsight, I would have worded it a little bit differently uh, because right now, a lot of the problem in the, in the West, people who don't bother to go to primary sources are saying, oh yeah, the gray rhino is the thing that is ignored, which you know, that's the elephant in the room. As I said, it's not the same thing. Um, but I had I emphasized the point that we ignore obvious things because they're obvious uh, to push forward this point that you know yes you do need to take a fresh look um, and my point is that every, we're vulnerable to all of them and it's been interesting though to see that in Asia they got what I'm talking about they know what a gray rhino is they know that you've got a choice that's why the Chinese government uses it and in the U United States they've tried to morph the term back into this elephant in the room. It's like both trying to justify do doing nothing. And you see a lot in the policy world where like, you know, somebody wants to prove that they've been to policy school. So they come to all of these, these uh, excuses about bureaucracies and political will and blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, I'm really smart because I'm going to tell you that you can't do anything about that. Um, so it starts with recognizing that vulnerability. And then of course, you know, in the gray rhino, there's a five stage framework for where the crisis is at. And that helps you to develop strategies. And then you are what you risk, it helps you to look inside. What, what are your innate personality factors that lead you to deal with risks a certain way? What are the experiences in your life that uh, you know, you've taken a risk and it worked out or you did something it didn't work out? And how do those interact with your innate personality? And then finally, the part that you really can control is your environment, your habits, the processes you have, you know, weird things like, uh, what you had for lunch, uh, whether you take Tylenol or not, Tylenol apparently increases risk taking, uh, the beat of the music that you're listening to, I'm mean, like weird things, the color of the paint, um, but also self-awareness, it goes back. So understanding how you are predisposed to recognizing or denying a risk and doing something or not can help you to change your processes, can help you to change your organizational culture, can help you to surround you with the people who will give you the information you need, the confidence that you need, or grab your arm and pull you back from the ledge when you're not paying attention. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Marta. Um, Lucas, your question, please. Yes. Um, Thank you very much, Lotfi. Uh, Michelle, it's great to have you here, and I can only reiterate that uh, I'm a big fan of your work as well, and uh, it gave me lots to think about. Um, Hugo and I are uh, coordinating our China program here at Ideas, and it's uh, incidentally called China Foresight, so we do try to stay ahead of the curve as well. Um, and one thing that often comes up um, is, you know, how some of the changes in the China space, and uh, but also in UK politics, which is, of course, one of our main audiences, impact on our own work. Um, and I was wondering, I mean, you mentioned self-awareness um, as one of the sort of key uh, organizational features that one should have to, to foresee or to, to think about and perhaps tackle and avoid a grey rhino. Um, and I was wondering that context, you, you know, you mentioned constructive risk taking earlier. Um, and uh, I was wondering whether you have an example, perhaps, of, 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 a, of an organization, um, a specific example of an organization that was successful at tackling a career rhino and perhaps, you know, avoiding some of the negative fallout that are often associated with them. Um, and, uh, you know, what did they do to, to stay ahead of the curve? What did they do to tackle that issue? Um, and what can we learn from that? Thank you very much. Great question, and it's actually an, an illustration of another one of the problems uh, with the way our minds work, the way things work, is that a lot of the companies that were successful in identifying and dealing with gray rhinos didn't end up having the problem, <laughs> so, so we never saw it. Um, but there is a, a good one, um, you know, I'm thinking about, um, I was at a Forbes conference years and years ago, I did a little bit of work for Forbes, and um, it was right when streaming was at the very beginning, and uh, Netflix was one of the companies uh, being being profiled. And of course, you know they were you know mailing the the DVDs and the little red wrappers and stuff. I subscribed. I loved it. Um, but they were starting to figure out you know what what happens to our model, and so that was when they started developing the algorithms to suggest things that people would like to watch, um, and they they transitioned fairly well. I mean, I think there's a whole new level of transition 
now as everybody's now coming into streaming. I don't know how well they're going to deal with that, but but I do have to say they've got some fantastic content that I've been watching a lot, including I reckon, recommend to all of you very highly Servant of the People, um, which is the uh, the uh, the uh, sort of a, a satire about a Ukrainian history teacher who has a rant on video and a student posts it and he gets elected to be president of Ukraine. And uh, it's it's eerily prescient. But uh, but yeah, so Netflix is a really, really good uh, example. Uh, so I hope that helps. There's also a lot of bad examples. You know, the book I talk about Kodak, you know, discovering the digital camera and going, oh, we don't want to cannibalize our existing business. And it didn't work out real well for them. But, but you know, I do a lot of work with companies that, you know, I, I um, in, in fact, the CEO of a, a custom boat company that I, I spoke with did a whole uh, blog post online about here are the gray rhinos that I see for my company. Here's how we're we're dealing with them. And it's just a matter of, of a very, very simple process. Getting, hey, we are regularly going to take a fresh look at our gray rhinos. You know, what are the obvious things in front of us? How well are we dealing with it? And what can we do better? And I've got a sort of a whole stakeholder analysis of, you know, who are the people who can help you solve the problem? Uh, you know, what agency do you have? Uh, and if you don't have it directly, you know, who do you know who can help to solve the problem? So it's self-awareness and this, you know, belief in your ability to do something, even if it's only part of, of the solution. And, and going back to the ESG too, uh, I think that uh, it's, it, they were, ESG has been right to get companies to identify risks so that investors can make better decisions. And I think the next phase is really to doing a lot more in companies identifying their own contributions to the problem and their own contributions to solving the problem. I mean, I think that's where ESG is moving and needs to move much more strongly because there's this, this backwash against a uh, backlash against greenwashing, but you know, companies that are, yeah, they're identifying all these risks, but not spending enough time on what are they doing about it? How are they helping to solve the problem? Thank you, Michelle. Um, there's a question in the Q&A box from Julia, Julia Ring, and uh, the question is, in your opinion, has anyone in the state, public or private sectors effectively used the grey rhino concept in their response to COVID? So when you look at the response to COVID. That is a great question. Um, and actually, when I looked at the, the the copy that my Chinese publisher put, uh, you know, in the, in the marketing of the gray rhino in China, uh, they actually uh, talk about it. And you know, it's actually very interesting to me to see how the the depiction of China's response in the West and in China is completely different. And uh, you know, that's a whole hornet's nest. Um, but it's it has been very interesting to me how the pandemic really brought a whole set of renewed attention to the gray rhino. I remember when it first started, there were a lot of people in Washington going, oh, black swan, black swan. Nobody could have seen this coming. And actually in, uh, in the gray rhino, there's a, the reference to pandemics because I was writing it during Ebola. And actually I mentioned something about, you know, pandemics being something that's happened before, happens regularly, gonna happen again. In the black swan itself, uh, Nassim Taleb, you know, talked about pandemics as not a black swan. He's been quoted all over the place going, not a black swan. You know, this is something that I said we needed to watch out for. Bill Gates, TED Talk, 2015. So many public health organizations, think tanks, uh, you know, national security agencies have come out and said there was, we're not prepared. We need to do more. There was even a, an exercise within the Trump administration months before it came out uh, yeah, but once before the, the, the virus was was discovered, saying we're not ready for this. Um, so I think that in a lot of ways, COVID was was a wake up call to uh, how how badly prepared we were, despite all these warnings. And and the gray rhino got a lot of attention because it did describe, hey, we've ignored this obvious thing. You know, unfortunately, uh, I, you know, there are so many areas where we're still falling short. Last week, in, or last week or the week before, the Chinese CDC actually came out with a report um, about recombinant strains of, uh, of COVID, of SARS-CoV-2, uh, and saying that we are starting to see 
different strains mix together and that the potential for gray rhinos from that is, you know, that this is a gray rhino event that's creating huge threats that we haven't seen, like something that is, you know, as infectious or more infectious than Omicron and as lethal as Delta or the other ones. So, so Chinese CDC actually just recently set out that warning and uh, we're seeing a lot of, of warnings, um, this, you know, Delta Cron and different new waves, uh, a lot of places, particularly the West, don't seem to have learned as much from uh, from our past mistakes as I might hope we have. But there, there, there's a real divide between people who uh, pay attention to the warnings and the ones who don't. Thank you, Michelle. So I'll come to my question next. Um, and this is about, um, you brought up the cultural dimension to the way we respond to the possibility of risk events. There seems to be an east-west divide. You mentioned that the regulator in Hong Kong and China um, used the concept and we saw market moves in response to that. But we haven't really seen Jay Powell or the you know, US Fed and the SEC use concepts of this kind. Um, and when it comes to ESG or climate change, even within the West, the US seems to be um, different, and, and I'll give you an example. In the UK, even in the UK, which is, you'd argue, culturally the closest to the US, climate change is not a politically contested issue. Uh, it's the debate, the political debate isn't about whether climate change exists or not. It's, you know, who's doing enough uh, uh, or not, and which vested interest is being prioritized. Whereas in the US, you can still, in polite company, have a conversation that borders on climate change denial, it would seem. On ESG, uh, the largest capital markets in the world are not the leaders. Leadership is arguably coming more from Europe and elsewhere. What is your view on why that difference uh, is there? And maybe the corollary to this is, Black swans. So as you know, in Southeast Asia or in Australia, black swans are not that rare. Um, and uh, in fact, I think in the Botanic Gardens in Singapore, you can, you can see two or three together uh, as well. And um, is it easier for us to accept the existence of black swans because it absolves us of responsibility? There's no shame in missing what was not visible. But if you're telling me that I'm ignoring something that is visible, then that's a personal affront to me. How dare you say that? So there I don't know, what of you is that? No, it's a really good point. And I, I get a lot of this defensiveness in the West that interestingly, I don't see in Asia um, that, you know, that people, I think that maybe that, you know, people are uh, more sensitive, more perceptive of certain risks and uh, actually, um, uh, a former professor of mine who's now uh, emeritus um, at uh, Seoul National University in Singapore has the Jungman Inst Institute, um, has done a fair amount of research on risk perception across Asia. And uh, a lot of Asian countries have, have higher risk perceptions or sensitivities in the first place. And uh, actually I was interviewed in, uh, by a Korean newspaper, When You Are What You Risk came out. And I've uh, included a chart in there by the Lloyd's Register Foundation, which does this world risk poll, which you should all take a look at. It's fantastic. They uh, they look at risk perceptions around the world and sort of compare that to how much a country has experienced. And they look at this gap between the experience and the worry level. And, you know, Korea was off the charts on the, on the worry level. So I think that the people do pay attention to the risks more in the first place in Asia. And uh, you know, I still haven't completely figured out why. I looked at a lot of theories in the in the chapter in You Are What You Risk on countries, and some of it has to do with you know confidence that the government's going to do something about it, which can work in a positive way or a negative way. There was some research showing that people people trusted the government in Singapore too much to deal with COVID that they weren't doing their own part, and so the government had to change some of its. Uh, messaging and rules to get people to uh, to step up. Um, and, you know, on climate change, I think that a solution aversion probably has 
an awful lot to do with the reaction in the West. I mean, you look at historical contribution of emissions and United States, Europe, you know, the richer countries are the ones who've done the most. So I, I think there's that's part of it. But they have actually started to uh, to use the gray rhino in that context here. In spring of 2020, nine U.S. senators, uh, sort of organized by Senator Schatz, uh, Brian Schatz, sent a letter to uh, to Jay Powell saying, if you don't watch out for, if you don't get climate pricing right, we're going to have another gray rhino event. Um, and I think that contributed to that. Um, the chair, the vice chairs of both Citigroup and uh, BlackRock have made statements um, at, at conferences at JP Morgan on ESG um, at the at the UN about climate change being a gray rhino. And uh, so it's it's definitely made its mark in in those conversations. It's uh, made its mark in in board conversations a lot. I've been on uh, so many board podcasts, and uh, uh, some of my work is uh, is at the is uh, featured in the the Directors and Chief Risk Officers Institute, which is a new organization helping with uh, to basically create positive uh, risk governance. Um, but I do think that policymakers need to take into account different risk perceptions uh, in different countries and multinational businesses need to take this into account. I, I talked to a, a, a woman who does a lot of uh, M&A advisory in Asia. She lives in the US and does advisory. And she's talking about some of the, the differences between attitudes of, of European, of Chinese, of, of US investors. And so being aware of the, you know, the risk fingerprint of a company in another country is really important. Being aware of the risk fingerprint of the decision makers. Like when you're negotiating something, if you look at the risks that another country cares about most, that gives you really interesting information. I did a presentation in January to the national security community in the U.S. comparing some of the research uh, on different countries. Uh, Ipsos has something called the, uh, uh, the Perils of Perception uh, Project which informally people call um, the ignorance index, so they try not to do it. And I, I'm, I'm but probably not, not being nice by saying it, but it's just such a great, uh, it's a great name. You know, Lloyd's Register poll, uh, some of the work that, that Gallup does, some of the work that Pew does, there are lots of really, really interesting studies of differences in risk perceptions, differences of you know, what the risks are, what the experiences are, uh, who they think has the ability to do something about it. And then you break that down to demographic groups and you see very different perceptions between you know, young and old and men and women. And I think that's really, really important. We don't spend nearly enough time looking at the, uh, the risk ideas that people bring to every conversation. Right. As uh, has often happened in the past, the questions keep coming in just at the, at the last I'll answer Most. super short. <laughs> so uh, we'll try and get through two questions that are in the question box. Uh, the first one, probably not so easy, but uh, it's from Anthony Valion. He's asking, how would the Great Rhino concept apply to unresolved land or political conflicts? He's got Israel, Palestine as an example, Middle East, Syria, Iraq, Kurds and so on. So when, when it's about political control over land. Those are the kind of gray rhinos that I call Gordian knots. <laughs> I actually got a sort of a, a taxonomy of different kinds, you know, how fast, how slow, uh, how easy to solve or how hard to solve, who's bought in, who's not, what are the motivations of the different players, what are the other issues that something is, uh, is related Two um, and Gordian knots, unfortunately, are things where it's really hard to find a good solution. But 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 some of that stakeholder analysis is actually very useful. And I've seen a couple articles in the last couple of days about the um, Ukraine situation and the you know access to uh, natural resources along the coast uh, being part of the reason that uh, that Russia is so keen on creating this uh, this land corridor. So I think it involves you know looking looking deeper at how each party defines the gray rhino uh, can help, you know, unravel the knot a little bit. I'm, I'm by no means saying it's easy, but the things that you mentioned are definitely the, the hardest, the most wicked ones to deal with. Imagine. 
And um, another one, this is from Sharon Lay, behavioral scientist, and she's asking, uh, what do you think about the possibility of using thinkers to help foresee gray rhinos and complex problems? Thinkers who are outside the box thinkers, outside you know, culturally marginalized thinkers into that problem solving room. Love, 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 love that. And, and it goes into, there's a whole chapter on, on demographics of risk perceptions and behavior that, that you know, people experience risks very differently. And I think a lot of, you know, middle of the road, able, you know, stereotypically quote unquote normal said with the, you know, tongue hugely in cheek, people don't realize the, the impacts on some of them of people who they don't consider consider to be normal. Some of the, the challenges that they have and how those, those have a feedback loop and also many of the benefits that, uh, that neurodiverse um, or other you know, untapped groups uh, bring. So absolutely, and I think that outside the box thinking is, is important. And you know, I, was, uh, I was involved in a conference in December on uh, rare events and sort of you know, risk response. In, uh, in the national security community. And it was very interesting that one person asked for recommendations of fiction, you know, of novels uh, predicting some of this stuff. And uh, I've actually discovered there's this whole cli-fi genre of, of, you know, climate science fiction. So I've been reading, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson and Neil Stevenson and uh, a bunch of other things uh, because I think it really does help you to uh, to connect. So thank you for that question because it's it's hugely important, and you know we'd love to collaborate in the future on on uh, on that path. Wonderful. So um, Sharon, you know where to find uh, Michelle. She'd love to collaborate. She said. And with that, we've come to the end of our time uh, today. Michelle, the um, the passion, the energy. Uh, it was tremendous, amazing, the infectious. Thanks for carrying the hour uh, for us. You've captured people's imagination uh, in multiple different ways. And we're truly, truly grateful that you took the effort, made the time to be here with us. And so from uh, Hugo, Lucas, Marta, myself, the rest of the LSC uh, community, uh, we'd like to thank you again. And thanks to the audience uh, for being here and asking your questions. Yeah. Thank you Bye -bye. for the great moderation. Thanks to everyone for the great questions and engagement. I always learn, learn from you. Uh, is you know, it is really a, a two way thing. So thank you. This has really been a, a great conversation. I'm glad to have been part of it. Wonderful. Take care. Until next time.